The Sixth Man Book of Horror Stories Audiobooks It was a yellowish, fleshless face, with an eroded and stony aspect which seemed to have been created by centuries of physiological misery. But something known, something familiar and yet terrifying and nightmarish suddenly stirred in Schoenenbaum's mind and wakened in him an extreme agitation. A hideous comprehension suddenly gripped his throat. Sweat burst out on his forehead. He was overcome with fear, that hideous fear which suddenly peoples the whole earth with hidden dangers. He was smiling, but the enormous fixed burning eyes lent this strangely triumphant smile something maniacal. At that moment, the man turned his head and Schoenenbaum recognised SS Commander Schultz, the torturer of the Torenberg camp. For one desperate second, the tailor clung to the hope that he might perhaps be the victim of an hallucination, or that he had been mistaken. Yet if there was one face he was in no danger of forgetting, it was indeed the monster's face. He recalled that Schultz had vanished after the war. Some people said he was dead. Some that he was living in hiding in South America. Now he saw the man with his own eyes. The arrogant heavy jaw, the cropped hair, the mocking smile. But there was something more frightening still than the monster's presence. Schoenenbaum felt his mind go blank. What he saw exceeded in its horror all the limits of the endurable. He tried to cry out, to call for help, to alert the population, but all he could do was open his mouth and wave his arms. His voice refused to obey him, and he stood there, staring with bulging eyes. He must have stood for a good minute in total unconsciousness. The monstrous absurdity of the scene taking place before his eyes finally robbed it of all reality. There were no flies on Frank that morning. After all, why not? He was a responsible citizen with a wife and child, wasn't he? It was a typical Frank morning, and with an agility that defies description, he leapt into the bathroom onto the scales. To his great Harold, he discovered he was twelve inches more tall heavy. He couldn't believe it, and his blood raced to his head, causing a mighty red colouring. I can't not believe this incredible fact of truth about my very body which has not gained fat since mother begat me at childburn. Yea, though I walked through the valley of thy shadowy hut, I will feed no Norman. What great qualms he hath taken me thus into such a fatty hardbuckle. Frank looked sadly at his wife, forgetting for a moment the cause of his misery. Walking slowly but slowly towards her, he took his head in his hands, and with a few swift blows had clubbed her mercifully to the ground dead. She shouldn't see me like this, he mumbled. Not all fat, and on her thirty-second birthday. Frank had to get his own breakfast that morning, and also on the following mornings. Two, or was it three? Weeks later, Frank awake again to find that there were still no flies on him. No flies on this, Frank boy, he thought. But to his amazement, there seemed to be a lot of flies on his wife, who was still lying about the kitchen floor. I saw his old face, moveless in thought, its curdled paste of skin, its eyes blank beneath heavy lids of his dark old age, its moulding of bone and its white pouches sagging like sacks out of spirit jars, and the benign white dome newborn above. All at once the motion came to me, this man is full of red. Inside, he's red. Soon, even at night, in bed, in the dark, far away from the green and the black and the white, I lay awake, thinking only of the red. Such matters must find their outlet. And one afternoon I could no longer bear it. Strong passions seized me. I determined to root the red out of that black and white old man. I went for him with a bread knife. I took the knife suddenly from the loaf of bread, it was in the middle of cutting a slice, and in a second I held it over him, pointed like a dagger. I saw that it was one with saw edges, with pleasure, with excitement, with the utmost careful concentration, I placed the blade exactly along the centre of his clean white dome and began to saw. It was no easy matter. I knew that from the beginning and already I had to steady the head with my left hand. But I kept on trying, and watched with some impatience and disappointment. For at first there was indeed a pinkiness. But then it all became a mess. You could have called none of it red, 
Certainly not in the light of that old room. Certainly not the red I was after. The maggot flopped lazily from her dry brown lips and lay on her rotting cheek. Too late to call out. She was too far away from the houses on the front. At last she was afraid of her father. She started to run, clumsily, her feet catching in the loose earth. She reached the edge of the field and ploughed through the weeds, her clothes caught up in her arms. She reached the edge of the plantation and found herself among the small pine trees, trees that scratched against her as she thrust between them. She was running uphill, and she realised with the sheer sharp knowledge of panic that she was running farther and farther from the town and help. She was running up the side of the mountain, and her father was coming behind her. Her father loved her, her mother loved her, and God loved her. You mustn't be afraid of your father. He took out his handkerchief and dipped it into the water. He took her hand and cleaned it carefully, wiping clear the small flesh grazes. She pulled herself upright against the rock and allowed him to wash her face, his fingers gentle against her skin the water cool and refreshing. He saw her evil in her eyes, and her pretty face, and her long fine hair, and the way she folded his handkerchief and tucked it into her sleeve, lewd, bad and wicked. As I write this confession, I consider these words which are drawn in the blood of my lover who is dead. She is without a heart. I cut out her heart. She is without blood. Her blood is for my pen, and presently there will be no more of her and me, for together we will burn and crumble, our organs of ecstasy reduced to a grey, impotent ash. This will be. What has happened is over, and lives only in my mind, in these blood-red words, and in the screams of my wife, whom I can hear through the open doors of my laboratory. I left them open for that reason. By now I believe that I am insane, yet I am aware of sensations more vivid than in all my sane life of fear. Now I am unable to feel fear. The feeling is good. My wife is screaming, and her screams rise from my operating table. She is strapped there, quite tightly. She is conscious, and before her is the body of Stella, my dead lover. Stella is naked. There is a small hole in her forehead. In the hole is a hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage is oyster to a lead peril. The bullet which killed her froze her breasts and chilled her succulents. I can see her now, and though she is dead, she excites me. There is another hole beneath her breast. There is blood on her flesh. The blood came from the incision I made when I cut her heart out. My pen is running dry, and so I dip into her blood. And now across my page I see full rich words glistening in the light of my reading lamp. I thrust my hand into the cavity in Stella's cold breast. My hand came out empty and covered with blood. I dangled it before my wife's eyes. She then lost consciousness. As I write she is still screaming. And Stella's blood has coagulated on my pen. I know that I must do it soon, before my sanity returns to bring me grief remorse, a million emotions that I must never know. Already I know that my madness is waning. The lamplighter had descended to the ground now and he put something down in the back of his cart. The horse shifted uneasily and again Mr. Sharstead caught the charnel stench, sickly sweet on the summer air. This is the town centre as far as I know, sir, said the lamplighter. As he spoke he stepped forward and the pale lamplight fell onto his face which had been in shadow before. Mr. Sharstead no longer waited to ask for any more directions, but set off down the road at breakneck speed. Not sure whether the green pallor of the man's face was due to a terrible suspicion or to the green-tinted glasses he wore. What he was certain of was that something like a mass of writhing worms projected below the man's cap, where his hair would normally have been. Mr. Sharstead hadn't waited to find out if this Medusa-like supposition were correct. Evening, Mordecai, they said. We thought you'd be joining us. Mr. Gingold equated him with these ghouls, he sobbed, as he ran on at headlong speed. 
if only he could make him understand. Sharstead didn't deserve such treatment. He was a businessman, not like these bloodsuckers on society. The lost and the damned. He couldn't face the possibility of walking these endless streets, for how long, and with the creatures he had seen. He opened the door and switched on the light and turned to find that the thing had followed him inside, that it shielded its weak eyes from the glare of the lamp, arm flapping across its face. It sat on the bed and sank its face down onto its chest and looked at the floor as the young man took off his coat. Damp and cold and stiff the poor thing was. Grey fingers laced by its throat fumbled across its face. Strands of white hair floated across its brow from beneath the peaked cap it wore. Its black coat was frayed and tattered. Blue tennis shoes without laces peeped from the folds of the coat where it flopped on the floor, grotesquely too large for the poor thing. The young man picked up his shiny tin kettle and went down the corridor to the bathroom to fill it. The thing unbuttoned its coat and laid its canvas cloth on the table. When the young man returned, the light was out. He reached for the switch, clicked it, and nothing happened. He took a cautious step into the room and the thing's cold hand came across his face. Its fingers lodged on his chin and forced back his head. The blood in his mouth was his own, and the twist of the meat skewer in his throat brought him gurgling to the bed, where the thing landed on his chest. At that point the young man died. The swift stroke of the scalpel was on dead flesh and his eyes placed carefully in the ashtray were unseeing. 